So good afternoon. Uh, before I proceed, uh, I would like to acknowledge, uh, uh, as mentioned, the contribution of my co-author, Queen Cell Oren, and also thank the uh, Bureau of International Trade Relations of the DTI, the Trade Services and Industry Staff of NEDA, and the Philippine Services Coalition for assisting us during the preparation of this paper by providing information and sharing their um, experience and insights, and of course, for taking part uh, in this webinar. Next slide, please. So uh, I will first provide the context of the paper, then describe the institutional arrangements for trade in services negotiations. The third part is the meat of the paper, where we review the participation of the country in various agreements at the multilateral level, regional, and bilateral levels. It examines the country's services-related commitments and identifies the opportunities available. I will then conclude with some of the challenges that need to be addressed for the country to maximize uh, its participation in agreements. Next slide, please. Next. Okay, so um, as mentioned by Dr. Abeta, the contribution of services is significant and it continues to grow. I think by now it's almost um, close to 70% of our global GDP. And in terms of cross-border trade, services make up approximately one quarter or a quarter of the value of global trade. And it is expected to grow by as much as 50%. So we'll account for uh, a third of global trade by 2040 if the reduction uh, in trade costs are um, accomplished. Now, in the last 20 years, most of the services trade openings have been bound in regional trade agreements rather than in the WTO. And unlike trading goods, which focuses on uh, reduction in tariffs, for services, it's really about the reduction or removal of price regulations. And um, of course, we can liberalize autonomously or unilaterally, but what are, there are benefits from doing it within the context of a trade agreement. So this includes, for example, number one, the trade agreements help the liberalization process by providing a framework with a set of principles, rules, and disciplines. Number two, because these are international contracts that cannot be changed uh, unilaterally, trade agreements create a more stable framework for trade. And then thirdly, because of the reciprocal nature of uh, trade liberalization in these agreements, it could also boost the political support for liberalization in the services markets. Next, please. Now, we observe that the Philippines has not been active compared to its ASEAN neighbors in foraging trade agreements. So um, these are the, in, in the table that uh, we have here, it shows the number of agreements that are already being implemented or signed. And as members of ASEAN, there are at least eight agreements that are common to all. And if we include those that are still under negotiation, actually the, the difference would even be larger. However, um, we note that it is the country's interest to participate in agreements because, and, and therefore pursue market access because of the comparative advantage of the Philippines in the services sector. Next slide, please. So in general, we want to assess how the Philippines can maximize uh, our participation in FTAs to realize the gains uh, from liberalization and facilitation. And specifically, we look at the uh, role of FTAs in delivering these benefits. Number two is to look at the challenges uh, at the regulatory and institutional levels. And then thirdly, identify the gaps and provide recommendations. Next, please. Okay, so now I will focus on the institutional arrangement. Uh, next. So before I uh, go into the details, I think it's important to discuss that or consider that there are many steps involved in, um, a, in trade negotiations for, for us to realize the benefits. So there are five key moments as according to Marconi, uh, Marconini and Sauvé. First is we have to have a, a national plan or uh, for services. We have to have a national strategy for services. Number two is uh, preparing for services negotiations. So this would involve developing a negotiating strategy and also conducting trade-related uh, regulatory audit. Number three, uh, the third step is the actual conduct of the negotiations where uh, you, we devise uh, strategies for the um, requests and offers that uh, either our requests and offers or those of our trade partners. And then the fourth um, um, step would be 
uh, the implementation of the negotiated outcomes. At this point, we have to address the regulatory capacities and also uh, some bottlenecks that uh, we can identify. And then finally, and actually this is the most important, ultimately, is that the ability to supply to newly open markets with competitive and international, um, international uh, uh, service suppliers that can meet the demands of the global market. So it's important to have a mechanism to support each of these steps. Next slide, please. So in our development plan, uh, chapter nine, uh, recognizes and the chapter nine is on industry and services it recognizes the importance of services and strategies to promote trade in services so for example it highlights the role of ITBPM education healthcare logistics construction transport related services and the creative industries the plan also identified priority reforms to remove barriers uh, to foreign investments and then uh, another chapter on competition policy is also relevant because it promotes fair competition, especially in transport, energy, and telecommunication services sectors. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of the uh, in institutional setup by law, there are two principal agencies involved um, in negotiating the country's international commitments. So we have the DTI, which is mandated to take the primary role in negotiating and reviewing existing international trade agreements. And then the other lead agency is the DFA, which is mandated to implement the three pillars of the Philippine foreign policy. Now, the, there are two groups, in effect, that uh, with similar memberships that are responsible for trade agreements. These are the Committee on Tariff and Trade Related Matters and the Philippine Council for Regional Cooperation. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the Committee on uh, Tariff and Related Matters advises the President and the NEDA Board on tariff and related matters and coordinates agency positions and recommends national positions in international economic negotiations. Uh, there are three levels in the CTRM. You have the committee proper, the technical committee, and uh, the subcommittees. There is a special technical committee on WTO matters uh, whose main function is to examine and recommend the Philippine position uh, at the WTO. And under the TCWM, uh, uh, the Interagency Committee on Trade in Services uh, 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 leads the negotiations, and it is the NEDA that acts as the chair of this, part of this particular uh, interagency committee, and it receives secretariat assistance from NEDA's trade services and industry staff. Next slide, please. Okay, in, uh, the second group is the Philippine Council for Regional Cooperation, which was created in 2011 to facilitate interagency coordination um, uh, and formulation of the Philippine policy towards uh, our relations or in various regional and interregional organizations and fora. So uh, this would include, for example, ASEAN, APEC, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN uh, Asia Europe meetings and the Forum for East Asia Latin America cooperation. Uh, the PCRC involves four uh, cabinet level uh, technical boards. And um, there's also under the AMTB is a committee on ASEAN Economic uh, Committee. The CAEC is chaired by the DTI and composed of the various departments and agencies concerned with ASEAN economic uh, and financial cooperation. Now, under the CAEC, DTI leads the services negotiations in ASEAN, ASEAN Plus One FTAs, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Next slide. Uh, next slide, okay. So this table presents the members of the Interagency Committee on Trade in Services. And you have uh, DTI, NEDA, and DFA, um, and they are responsible for the uh, cross-cutting issues, but for specific modes of supply, you have, for example, for mode one, um, or cross-border supply, you have the Data Privacy Commission, for example, for mode two, consumption abroad, you would have um, Department of Tourism, for mode three, which is about uh, the establishment of commercial presence, you would have BOI and SEC, and then for mode four, or the movement of natural persons, this would be handled by the 
uh, DOLE. And then, of course, for each of the sectoral uh, issues, you would have the relevant agencies um, participating. So in a particular agreement, either the DTI or the NEDA would handle the coordination of services negotiations. Uh, as we understand, however, they have no veto power over positions taken by other agencies, and trade policy making is done by consensus. And then individual departments and agencies bring their own initiatives, research, and trade positions. So to summarize, we have two lead coordinate, uh, we have two lead coordinators for services negotiations. And the responsibility for shepherding the, a particular nego uh, negotiation depends on the trade forum or footprint of the agreement. Next slide, please. So now we will, uh, I will present the review of uh, the Philippine participation in various trade agreements. Next. So we start at the multilateral level. So the agreement at the multilateral level is relatively young compared to the counterpart in goods. The General Agreement on Trade and Services uh, was signed in 1994, whereas the um, General Agreement on tariff, Tariffs and Trade was signed in 1947. So the GATS uh, establishes a set of rules and disciplines governing the use um, by WTO members of various measures affecting services trade. And uh, trade is liberalized uh, through a series of market access and national treatment commitments specified in the schedules, which describe the, the terms, limitations, and conditions. Uh, the GATS also uh, defines standards of transparency and uh, several other disciplines on good governance for the services sector. It is important to highlight that the GATS explicitly recognizes the right of, it, of the members to regulate, to pursue its national uh, policy objectives. Next slide. So these figures reflect the subsectors included in the schedule of the Philippines and, it, and its trade partners. The left panel shows the commitments of ASEAN member states in the GATS and uh, please note that we uh, we only counted the subsectors. It does not reflect the depth of the commitments uh, made across the sectors. So whether or not uh, full or partial commitments were were made are not reflected here. Uh, nonetheless, it shows that the Philippines, an original member of the WTO, committed fewer subsectors uh, compared to other members. And uh, you will also notice that Cambodia, Vietnam, and Lao PDR which joined in 2004, 2007, and 2013, respectively, uh, included more subsectors in their commitments. And then the right panel shows the subsectors uh, of the other, of the commitments of the other FTA partners of the Philippines. And again, uh, showing that the Philippines committed fewer um, subsectors compared or except for India. And uh, to date, further multilateral uh, negotiations, well, it started in 2001 under the Do uh, Doha Development Agenda, but no outcomes have been achieved uh, so far in terms of additional market openings. The most recent achievement at the WTO in terms of services is the um, signing of the Joint Initiative on Services uh, Domestic Regulations, uh, which was uh, signed last year. And, and, and uh, I believe the Philippines uh, joined uh, this particular uh, initiative. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, in terms of bilateral agreements, the Philippine-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement was the first FTA signed by the Philippines in 2006. Uh, the agreement contains a chapter on services trade with an annex on financial services in a chapter on the movement of natural persons. Uh, commitments were made using the positive list approach, so similar to GATS. And um, however, these commitments also included a standstill obligation, which means that they do not deviate from the current laws and regulations, or they observe the status quo. Uh, this ensures transparency and stability of the domestic laws and regulations. And the, the Japan or the Philippine Japan uh, EPA was the first agreement that adopted this approach uh, with respect to services. And then the Japan Malaysia and Japan Indonesia EPAs followed um, accordingly 
the the EPA also requires the preparation of trans, of a transparency list, which is a list of existing measures not conforming to market access and national treatment obligations. Um, a transparency list is purely um, prepared for the sole purpose of increasing the transparency of restrictions. Um, okay, so compared to the uh, GATS, the Philippines added 38 new commitments uh, in uh, the PJPA. Um, next slide, please. Uh, uh, compared to, um, uh, so the Philippines added 38 new commitments, but removed seven, uh, resulting in 74 scheduled subsectors. For Japan, it offered its entire GATS commitments and added 35 subsectors for a total of 139 subsectors. And additionally, um, so as I mentioned, you, uh, in this particular agreement, there's a commitment to indicate uh, the status quo or make standstill commitments. So the table on the right uh, lists the new commitments made by both parties under the Philippine-Japan EPA compared to the GATS. Or to the left, rather. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so through the agreement, Japan expanded the categories of natural persons allowed to supply services and specifically included nurses and caregivers. Uh, as of in only about 30 uh, of the 547 nurses and 20% uh, 20 of the care workers passed the Japanese qualification exams. And um, however, uh, in terms of other aspects of the agreement, uh, uh, the PJPA is also promoting better cooperation and capacity building projects to benefit the services sector. Um, so cooperation includes activities in ICT, transport, uh, transportation, financial and tourism services, among others. Uh, in the latest general review, two working groups were created to study the inclusion of uh, micro, small and medium enterprises and e-commerce in the agreement. Uh, and then uh, there's, of, of course, ongoing efforts to negotiate, improve, uh, improve market access. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the next is the Philippines European F, uh, FTA, FTA, so EFTA which is the second bilateral uh, FTA of the Philippines. It uh, includes uh, the EFTA states, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Switzerland. Um, and it entered into force in 2018 uh, for the Philippines, Norway, and Liechtenstein. But for Switzerland, it entered into force in January, 20, uh, January 2020. The chapter on services trade closely follows the GATS approach. It uh, covers uh, all the four modes of uh, uh, all services sectors and all four, four modes of supply. And there's also a separate annex on financial services, telecommunications, movement of natural persons, maritime transport, and energy related services to complement the chapter with additional disciplines uh, specific to those sectors. So, next slide, please. Uh, the Philippines committed the least number of subsectors compared to the EFTA member states. Uh, so comparing, uh, if you compare it with GATS, Philippines and Liechtenstein committed more, sub, uh, uh, more subsectors in the PHFTA uh, because for the Philippines, we start, we start from a low base. So in terms of the increment, it's uh, significant. Uh, you will notice also that no country made commitments in health related and social services uh, possibly indicating that this is a sensitive sector for um, bound liberalization. Uh, next slide, please. So the Philippines made 41 new commitments in PHFTA. And uh, so I won't uh, go into it because they're here in the slide. Uh, notice uh, to add up uh, to the total because in some cases, uh, uh, commitments made in GATS were not introduced in the uh, EFTA uh, agreement. Okay, um, next slide, please. So it's a relatively new agreement, and but uh, it is hoped that 
uh, Filipino services suppliers, particularly the skilled workers and professionals, will benefit from uh, movement of natural persons uh, commitments. Uh, for mode one and mode four, uh, it would help uh, suppliers and skilled labor and professionals, particularly in uh, architecture and uh, engineering. Um, the entry and temporary presence of service suppliers in, uh, in such as business visitors, uh, intercorporate transferees, and contractual service providers are also included. Um, and I think in, in some cases, the economic needs test were also waived. So hopefully, uh, again, it's a relative agreement, and so hopefully the FTA will encourage uh, foreign direct investment uh, into the Philippines, particularly in the IT BPM sector, renewable energy uh, sector, construction and related engineering, environmental, maritime transport, and financial services. Uh, next slide, please. Now, for the regional um, agreements, uh, we have ASEAN and the formal process of liberalization in ASEAN started with the signing of the ASEAN Framework, uh, framework Agreement on Services in 1995. So uh, it has uh, essentially the aim is to create a free trade uh, area uh, in services and it uh, adopts a GATS plus principle, which means that uh, member states uh, sh shall schedule commitments under AFAS that go beyond their GATS commitments. And the results of the negotiations are formalized in packages of schedules of commitments under AFAS. And the latest package of commitment under the AEM is the 10th package. And there are also parallel um, uh, negotiations and commitments that can be found in finance, financial services, and also in, in, trans in the transport sector. Or, um, yeah, uh, under the purview of the ASEAN transport ministers. Okay, next slide, please. So this figure reflects the 10th package. This is the latest. 10th uh, package based on the assessment of the ASEAN Secretariat. Um, ASEAN member states have made commitments to liberalize almost all of the services sectors and subsectors under the purview of the AEM, ranging from um, at least, I think, uh, the most is 122 out of the total universe of 128 the sensitive um, sectors or commercially insignificant uh, subsectors. Uh, yeah. Next slide, please. Okay, the latest development in ASEAN is the adoption of the uh, ASEAN Services Agreement uh, or ATISA, which is supposed to be the enhanced AFAS. So, um, if you recall, in AFAS, the goal was to create a free trade area in services. In ATISA, the goal is more ambitious because it really the economic integration ambition of the region. Uh, and therefore, um, in terms of the approach to negotiations, it's supposed to be more liberalizing because it now adopts the negative list approach. So under the negative list approach, member countries specify the sectors which are exempted from the obligations of liberalization. And these are contained in a list of reservations and non-conforming measures. Um, and there, in addition, there are also regulatory disciplines in ATISA that were not found or were not included in AFAS. The three sectoral annexes in ATISA are financial services, telecommunication services, and air transport and ciliary services. Uh, mode 4 uh, will no longer be part of the services agreement as these are contained in a separate agreement, which I will discuss. Uh, next slide, please. So there are three uh, key ASEAN initiatives that promote the mobility of service suppliers in the ASEAN region. One is the movement of natural persons, which uh, is intended to provide the legal framework uh, towards eliminating substantially all restrictions in the temporary uh, cross-border movement of natural persons involved in the provision of trade, trading goods, uh, trade in services and investment. So um, 
uh, please note that it only uh, covers temporary entry and, uh, and stay of natural persons. Uh, it does not cover the movement of unskilled labor or those that are um, entering another country for the purpose of permanent employment or permanent migration. So these are not uh, covered. And then the uh, mutual recognition arrangements recognize the uh, qualifications of foreign service suppliers by authorities in another country. And then the third initiative is the ASEAN Qualifications Reference Framework, uh, which is a common reference framework to compare qualifications throughout uh, uh, the education and training sectors across the ASEAN member states. Uh, next slide, please. So, so, so there are seven professional services um, that are included in the, or that have signed MRAs. And in addition, um, there's also a mutual recognition arrangement on tourism. And the focus now of ASEAN is uh, in implementing the MRAs and to improve the mobility of professionals in these uh, sectors. Next slide, please. So this table shows the registered ASEAN professionals. Uh, to Based on this table, Filipinos so far make up uh, 10% of the ASEAN accountants. In terms of ASEAN architects, 22%, and for ASEAN engineers, 12%. Next slide, please. Okay, so ASEAN is not only integrating its economy among its member states, but it also is engaging key dialogue partners uh, through the FTAs, uh, various FTAs and uh, comprehensive economic partnership agreements. And for uh, all of these FTAs, the liberalization of services is a key uh, feature. So I, I'll go to the next uh, more exciting uh, region. Next slide, please. So the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is the latest and largest preferential trade agreement to recognize the increasing significance of services. RCEP is an agreement between um, ASEAN and the ASEAN FTA partners, uh, Australia, China, India, Japan, Korea, and New Zealand. Uh, it was signed by the ministers in 2020 and, um, and eventually signed, uh, however, without India and it entered into force this year. Uh, for the Philippines, this was signed in September by the president and is now waiting or is now being discussed at the Senate. Uh, so based on the assessment of the ASEAN Secretariat, the RCEP is significantly broader and deeper compared to all the ASEAN uh, FTAs, the other FTAs that I showed you earlier. In the area of trading services, this includes a separate chapter for M&P, Three annexes on uh, each on uh, one each on financial services, telecommunications, and professional services. And uh, similar to ATISA, the in the um, uh, latest or the uh, most prominent feature of the RCEP is the scheduling of market access commitments using the negative list approach, either at the conclusion of the negotiations or within a specific timeline after the entry of uh, into force of RCEP. So um, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, China, and New Zealand initially adopted the, uh, the positive list. And I, I believe we have uh, three years to transition to a negative. Uh, so we adopted the positive list and we have three years to transition to the negative list approach. Uh, the resulting trading services and um, temporary movement of natural persons chapters and along with the market access commitments under these chapters uh, are considered to be uh, significantly better than any of the uh, previous FTAs as I, as I have mentioned. So next slide, please. Uh, so this is from the, I think the, an assessment from the DTI. Uh, uh, it shows the improved commitments under RCEP compared to the ASEAN plus, plus one FTAs. And again, RCEP members accord preferential treatment for skilled professionals and business persons uh, in legal, construction, engineering, and banking services. Uh, but I think the figures here are about um, commercial presence and the market access commitments 
um, for mode three in various in these sectors listed on the slide. And uh, another important aspect of RCEP is that there is a chapter on economic and technical cooperation that is built into the agreement. Uh, next slide, please. So the table shows the number of subsectors that the Philippines committed in RCEP. Uh, out of the total 155 subsectors, so that is the universe, the Philippines committed 103 subsectors, which is significantly higher than the 43 that we had committed in the multi in the GATS or at the multilateral level. So next slide, please. So now I will focus on the final part, which is to talk about the challenges and the way forward. Next slide. So um, since it, uh, the Philippines prepared its first schedule in the 1990s, the Philippines has expanded the coverage of subsectors that it has bound in agreements. So for comparability with the AFAS, we removed the uh, commitments in financial services, air transport services, and services covered in the uh, AKIA or the Agreement on Investment. So in a sense, uh, by binding more subsectors, the certainty or predictability of our policy regime has improved over time. Although um, obviously this is only with respect to our partners in preferential trade agreements. Next slide, please. Now, while the coverage has increased, the degree of bound liberalization is another issue. Water in the schedule of commitments refers to the difference between the bound level of restrictiveness and the actual or applied regulation. So this could occur uh, by not including any sector, which is the highest level of water, or um, and, and this means that the fewer sectors you include, the higher the water or the policy space, uh, it's also called. Uh, another type of water is created when, for example, uh, quantitative limitations are more restrictive than what the domestic laws allow. So, as indicated in the previous tables, not all sectors have been included in the schedule of commitments of the Philippines. And in addition, there are cases where some sectors were included. However, the limitations were set at a more restrictive level than uh, what is allowed in our laws. So. Um, uh, it should be noted that water uh, binding overhang or policy space uh, is not unique uh, in to the Philippines, and so most all countries have water in their schedules. Uh, however, and uh, and the extent of water could be significant. However, uh, there are welfare gains from from reducing policy uncertainty by reducing the difference between bound and applied uh, policies and even by binding the status quo to encourage trade um, from our trading partners. So overall, commitments that bind the existing regime is preferred to one with water, although the latter would still be better than unbound policy regime. And services agreements provide a mechanism for parties to reduce policy uncertainty by setting an upper bound on the level of trade restrictiveness. So we know that um, there are recent policy reforms that will effectively open up key sectors in the economy. Uh, this will allow the government to have more policy space, which we recommend it should judiciously exercise in the context of international trade agreements so that uh, you have to balance the need for policy space uh, on the part of government, but at the same time, the need for of the private sector for more certainty in our policy regime. Uh, next slide, please. So the the second issue uh, is uh, focuses on um, uh, enhance uh, seizing market opportunities. So a, a trade agreement does not end with the signing of the document. The next steps involve implementing negotiated outcomes and supplying newly open markets with services. So um, through the FTAs, the Philippines obtained market access and non-discriminatory treatment uh, with our various trading partners. However, and, and, and this may not be different from the actual policy, but uh, at least these are secured under the agreement. So it is important to engage and capacitate the private sector and assist uh, SMEs in particular 
uh, an, an organization such as the Philippine Services Coalition could be instrumental in making sure that the industry stakeholders are actively involved in each stage of in each stage of the services negotiation or nego uh, life cycle. So the final um, issue that we would like to raise, next slide please. Uh, refers to the um, uh, structure for negotiations. So in the updated development plan, it recognizes the need to strengthen the governance structure of trade negotiations. And we recommend that for trade in services, the first step towards strengthening governance would be to consolidate uh, negotiations in one agency instead of the current setup where the lead coordination role is split between two agencies depending on the trade partner and the scope of the agreement. And so this, in our view, would ensure coherence and consistency in the uh, formulating the negotiating positions, uh, whether it's done at the bilateral, regional, or plurilateral levels and uh, multilateral levels. And in our view, it is the DTI rather than the NEDA, that, that, uh, which would be a better fit because it's already uh, involved in trade negotiations. And it, uh, it, of course, in terms of linkage with the industrial policy and also uh, the business sector, uh, it would, um, I think we, we think the DTI would be better suited for the negotiations. It does not mean that NEDA does not play a role, of course. Uh, the role of NEDA is very important in providing uh, guidance and the overall trade policy. Uh, and later on in the assessment of gains and impacts. And NEDA could also focus in identifying and championing the domestic reforms that are needed to advance services trade um, and focus on this rather than in participating in trade negotiations. So this is the last um, recommendation. Um, I will conclude right now. Thank you.